Hey everyone, welcome to episode 7. Today, we're going over the Atari 2600. This video might be a little long due to Atari's long and interesting history, so I'll try to have a shorter version available. So if you've seen my previous videos, then you know my first experience with video games was with my uncle's Atari 2600. It was a wood grain variant. Now there were several wood grain variants available, including the Heavy Sixer, the Light Sixer, the Force Switch, and of course the Sears version, known as the Sears Telegames. Now there were two others that were also well known. One was an all-black model based on the original wood grain, and that was known as the Vader model. And then there was also a re-release later on in the Atari 2600's life, known as the Atari 2600 Junior, and that had a much more modern, sleeker look to it, including an all-black design with a brushed metal nameplate. Now this was the first console I ever owned, and it was the first major purchase I made with my own money as well. And so that model has, you know, probably the most meaning to me, other than, of course, the one my uncle owned. The Atari 2600 was released in 1977 at a retail price of $199. That's $860 in today's money. It contained an MOS 6507 CPU, which was a variant of the processors used in other computer systems and video game consoles of the time, especially the 6502 and the 6510, which were featured in the NES, the Apple II, Commodore 64, and other computer and gaming systems. It initially shipped with two joystick controllers and the game Combat. It also had a long lifespan, beginning in 1977 and ending in 1992. It utilizes game cartridges and launched with about nine games. Atari's founders, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, were concerned about a single game system not getting enough interest, so they got Atari's engineers to work on a multi-game system. Their previous home console, Pong, was successful, but it was a one-time purchase. It was costly to make and costly for families to purchase. By releasing a system that had interchangeable cartridges, it allowed Atari to not only save on production costs, but also allowed for additional revenue sources by way of new game releases. This also allowed gamers and families to buy additional games at their leisure and at a reduced cost. Buy the console and get a game now, and then later on all you need to do is buy more games. It's basically a win-win for both sides. Now, Atari was afraid of competitors copying their idea of using cartridges, so they tried to get suppliers to deny sales to the competition, but that didn't go over too well. And unfortunately for Atari, a company by the name of Fairchild Semiconductor released the Fairchild Channel F, a console utilizing cartridges, in 1976, beating Atari to the market. Bushnell was looking to speed up development, but needed the funds to do so. He considered going public, but instead sold to Time Warner. Using the $100 million influx of cash, they were able to complete the project. While it sold around 400,000 units in its first year, it wasn't an immediate success. The next couple of years were rough, with funding issues, loss of several developers, and the eventual departure of Nolan Bushnell. It also faced competition from Mattel with its Intellivision and Magnavox with the Odyssey, both also capable of playing cartridges. What really made it popular, though, was the release of Space Invaders. This helped sales rise to 2 million by 1980, and by 1982, 10 million consoles had been sold. However, it should be noted that Space Invaders was not the most popular game on the system. That title goes to Pac-Man, despite the fact that 2600 port of the game was considered one of the worst out there. However, with over 7 million copies sold, it was the most popular Atari 2600 game through its lifespan. Back in 2008, a programmer by the name of Dennis Debro released a homebrew version of Pac-Man to try and get it to be as close as possible to the original arcade version. There'll be a link in the description below if you want to read more about it. Seeing the success the Atari was having, third-party game developers started to flock to the system, including their competitors Mattel and Coleco, releasing versions of games available on their respective systems for the Atari 2600. They realized the potential for a new revenue stream. However, the flood of bad games, including some from Atari themselves, contributed to public disappointment and the eventual death of the home video game market. Take E.T. for example. What a horrible game, seriously. Now initially it was actually critically acclaimed, but that didn't last very long. They only sold about 1.5 million copies out of about 3.5, 4 million, so they had a lot left over, of which they ended up burying in the landfill. Another contributing factor to public disappointment 
was the fact that the box covers and the box art, while beautiful, in no way, shape, or form represented what the actual game looked like or was even about. Anyway, all of these and other factors led to the eventual video game crash of 1983. Basically, the US home video game market was dead. That is, until Nintendo released the NES in 1985. I actually did a couple of videos on the NES a while back, I'll put the links below. Time Warner was desperate to sell Atari, and ended up selling to Commodore's Jack Trammell. He was more focused on home computers, which were gaining in popularity, and this effectively killed off the Atari 2600, as well as other projects they were working on. However, due to the reinvigorated home video game market thanks to Nintendo, Atari re-released the Atari 2600 in the form of the Atari 2600 Junior. At $50, which is around $125 today, it was a much more affordable option than the NES, which retailed for around $180, which is about $480 in today's money. This basically restarted the success Atari had experienced years prior. Now, during the early lifespan of the 2600, Atari had also developed and released the Atari 5200, which was a much more powerful console, but it was not a sales hit. They also initially released the 7800 in 1984 for about $140, which was $350 today, and it was compatible with just about every 2600 game out there. But since the market was in decline, they scrapped the rest and kept them in the warehouse. Once they saw how popular the NES was, and along with the fact that the 2600 was seeing a sales resurgence, they re-released the 7800 for about $80, which is about $187 today. It was fairly profitable for them. However, in 1992, Atari announced that all 8-bit systems would be discontinued, including the 2600, the 7800, and their 8-bit line of computers. Yes, that's right, Atari made home computers, but we won't discuss those today. Okay, enough boring facts. Let's open one up. So if you saw my September pickups video, you'll know that the console was pretty dirty, and I didn't even want to take it out of the bag. So the first thing I had to do was clean it. Got some pictures of the before and after. I didn't take any video, because I figured you guys would not want to sit there and watch me scrubbing plastic all day. I also took some photos of the main motherboard, as well as a daughter board that contains all of the switches, including the power switch. After cleaning, I noticed that there were some scratches, probably from normal wear and tear, which is to be expected. However, the wood grain finish seems to be either painted on or silk screened on, and there's going to be no real easy way to do it. I'm not a really good painter, so I'm probably just going to end up using contact paper. I know, not the most elegant solution, but it is what it is, and it's probably going to be a lot better than what I can do with a paintbrush. On top of that, there's also the orange trim that goes around the switches. It was also kind of faded away in some spots, so I just ended up scrubbing it off. Of course not, it didn't look right, so I went online to try to see if anyone had any solutions for this, and they did. Someone found an orange paint pen that was almost an exact match for the same color orange that they originally used. So I bought one of those and repainted the trim. This is what it looks like. I also used the same orange paint pen on the controllers because that little circle guide thing that goes around the joystick area, not sure what it's called, so sorry. If anyone knows, leave a comment. But I ended up using the paint pen to recolor that as well because that was also kind of faded and scratched. I actually took some footage of that as well as the disassembly of the controller to give it a little bit of a cleaning. And here that is.
So a little bit more information before we actually show off the finalized console. There are some mods available to help improve the picture quality. Now you see by default the Atari 2600 only outputs RF. However, there are mods available that will allow you to be able to output in composite as well as RGB. Now these mods require some good soldering skills, and if you don't have that, you could probably find some to do it for you. There's a lot of places online that will perform these mods for you, but they're not cheap, and they require you to send your console to them. However, Hyperkin makes an Atari 2600 compatible clone console. If you saw my NES video, you remember I mentioned that they made a clone console for the NES. Well, for the Atari, they have the Retro N77. Note, they do not sponsor this video or channel. This is just part of my own research that I am conveying to you so you know what options are available. At around $70, it's probably a much more cost-effective solution if you want to play it on your modern television. Compatibility isn't too bad, though there are a few games that just don't work right. I don't have the list of compatible and compatible games at the moment, but I'll make sure I leave a link in the description below so you can take a look. However, for purists, nothing will be as good as the original console, so I guess you'll just have to mod it if you're one of those. I guess it just depends on whether you want the absolute best picture quality while retaining full compatibility with your original console, or you just want something you could pick up once in a while and play a quick game or two. And here's the mostly restored console. Again, here's the orange trim that I repainted, and as you can see, I applied the contact paper to the wood grain finish. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an exact match. This was the closest I could get. It seems like no one ever has anything that I actually need in the area. Wonder why retail's dying, right? Anyway, I can always try to find a closer match later. It doesn't stick permanently to the console, which is nice. Now, I did say mostly restored, because in the bottom right corner, you'll notice that the Atari logo isn't there. Now, I did buy a silver paint pen to try to recreate it, but as I mentioned before, I'm not very good at painting, so what I tried to do was print the logo off the internet and cut it out to make a stencil. But no matter what I tried, I couldn't get the lines clean enough, so I just stopped. Maybe I can try to find some sort of metallic colored stickers online, or maybe I'll give this stencil option another go at it, we'll see. If I do, I'll make sure to do a follow-up video. And as mentioned earlier, I also restored a couple of the joysticks, as well as cleaned all the games. However, some games are going to need to be relabeled. Now I plan on doing a video sometime in the future about making new labels, box art, etc. I know it's kind of a controversial subject since some people want to keep everything original even if it's damaged, whereas other people want it to look good for their collection. Either way, I think it'll be a fun little project to do, so keep an eye out for that video. If you want to be notified, please subscribe and then hit the little bell icon so you get notified of future videos. Here's another controller that I decided not to refurbish or anything, and you can see where some of the orange paint is still left but the rest had faded. Well, here's the repainted controller compared to the old one. And as stated earlier in the video, the orange is almost an exact match for the original. Pretty cool, huh? I will leave a link in the description below to the forum post where I initially found out about the orange paint pen. So that's it for today. What did you think? Leave a comment below about the video or even just your favorite Atari 2600 memories. If you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe if you want. But if you didn't like the video, go ahead and hit the thumbs down but please leave a comment below as to what you didn't like about it so I can try to make improvements in the future. Thanks all, and I'll catch you later.